Hello and welcome once again to Science or Not. I am Oblivious Alsk, as you might have noticed from the previous episodes. Since I haven't been able to make an episode in two weeks because I've been studying like crazy, 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 there's been so much crazy new cool science stuff that's come out. And in this show we're not going to talk about any science that was discovered long ago because there's so much stuff. I don't know if I'm going to be able to get through all of it, but I'm certainly going to try. And as such, I'm either going to be talking really, really fast or it's going to be a really long episode. Or it could be both. I like both. You know, in elementary school, I used to spell both with the letter L randomly in there. Both. B-O-L-T-H. But just so I can actually start this episode, let me just mention, whenever there's some sort of reason why I can't film science or not, I've started a new channel, which is actually the old channel, but it's new because I'm going to be posting stuff on it for once, where when I can't film one of these episodes, I film random other vlogs where I just talk about whatever happened to me in a given day. So if you can't stand going another day without hearing my lovely voice. You can just hop on over to my other channel, which basically looks like me talking and walking and doing random stuff like this. Also, you might have noticed I have a new background. This is only a temporary new Monopoly background. It'll probably change back to the big face behind me next week. But on to science stuff. The first thing I want to talk about is the huge earthquake that just happened in Japan. And if you haven't heard about it and you're watching me instead, you're probably living under a rock. And I'm not going to cover this story, but I am going to mention just a couple things about it. The first thing, my heart goes out to anyone who has any friends in Japan or acquaintances or anything like that, or even if you were in Japan. I'm aware the Red Cross is accepting donations. I'm, I'm aware that many places are accepting donations. So if you feel the need, please donate. I'm sure they need it. The other thing I want to mention about it is naturally the scientific aspects about it. The earthquake that's just hit Japan has done a number on not just Japan, but the world as well. To start, because of plate tectonics, eastern Japan has actually shifted towards North America a full 13 feet. The quake has also shifted the Earth's axis by 6.5 inches, and thus shortened the entire day, every day to come, by 1.6 microseconds. Now this ain't much, but every day is 1.6 microseconds. But if you think about what happens over a week, or maybe a year, or 10 years, or 100 years. It really starts piling on. But even with the change, it's still only about that of a minute for 100 years. So I guess it's not really that important to the current generation. But I guess what that really means is, every day you have slightly less time to get everything done that you need to get done. Including watching me in this show. But also, because of the country's 1995 earthquake, Japan placed a whole bunch of high-tech sensors around the country to observe even the slightest movements of plate tectonics. And this let the Japanese scientists calculate the earthquake's specific happenings down to the inch, meaning that this is overwhelmingly the best recorded great earthquake ever. But I'll go on to some lighter news now. Okay, so maybe this next story isn't going to be lighter news per se. It's kind of earth-shaking natural disasters type of news. Apparently on March 19th, the moon will swing around the Earth more closely than it has in the past 18 years. This will light up the sky even more, and it would be just 221, 567 miles away. Can any of you jump that high? Scientists are actually calling this the extreme supermoon, because those are so scientific terms. But they say that when the moon goes super extreme, chaos will ensue. And no, none of the werewolf type. Although I can imagine some crazy people just start howling at the moon for fun. I might do it, who knows. However, this is still astrology, not necessarily a real science, but it still makes connections between anatomical and mystical events. It's really not that all crazy. I mean, moon gets closer, gravity does crazy stuff, and you get crazy stuff happening. But again, we'll have to see what happens by March 19th. Next story, moving on. Next thing I want to talk about has to do with the oldest fossil discovered that shows even possible human ancestry, namely that of Lucy. I'm not really sure why they named it that, but nevertheless, Lucy has been a being of quite much debate seeing that she is 3.2 million years old, and seeing that the Christian calendar is only 5,000-ish. However, they've never been quite able to tell if Lucy was a walker or a swinger, namely, did she walk on two legs, or did she swing around trees like a monkey? This article wasn't quite clear if they had just been looking at some old bones of Lucy or if they made a new find, but nevertheless, they've come up with a new theory about Lucy. Mainly, they were looking at a bone, a metatarsal, one of the... One of your the bones in your feet. I can't pull my foot up high enough for you guys to see. But uh, one of those ones that is characteristic of a foot arch, and not one that's characteristic of grabbing branches that monkeys have. This is a good picture to show what I'm talking about. You can kind of see the arch in the bottom. So they're actually thinking that Lucy was not a swinger, but a walker. So really one of the first ancestors of humankind. And because of our time schedule this week, on to the next story. 
This one's about really old human-based stuff, too. Apparently, scientists have made a really cool discovery in California in which they've found the oldest fishing tackle set ever, namely being 12,000 years old. This isn't so much groundbreaking history type thing. I just thought it was kind of cool. I mean, you leave your fishing kit out by the river one day, forget it there, and you never come back to retrieve it, and 12,000 years in the future, some archaeologists dig it up with little tiny tools and brushes. The funny thing about this, though, is that the article also mentions that the people who use this tackle set also had a great deal of their diet consisting of birds. Imagine trying to catch a bird with a fishing hook. <laughs> I got one! He's flying away! I guess that's a big bird. But it's also important because it shows that people were fishing long before we ever thought they were. Anyway, on to the next thing. I told you there were a lot of things. Going to move faster. An astrobiologist associated with NASA named Dr. Richard Hoover says that he has found fossils of bacteria. Here we are with bacteria again. Fossils. And the reason this is a big deal is because this life actually resembles some that we found on Earth. He found these fossils by breaking up an incredibly rare type of meteorite, which there are only nine of that have been discovered in the world, and looking at it under an electron microscope. But unlike all those other alien conspiracy theorists out there in the world, Dr. Hoover has opened up his findings to the scientific community to be scrutinized thoroughly before he releases all of what he's theorized. So he's not like one of those whack jobs running down the street going, The world is gonna end! All of those arsenic aliens are going to stick their anal probes in again! It happened to me once! But no, he's not going to do that. This is actually giving him more respect from me, and I assume others, because of the touchiness of the subject. However, after all the scrutiny went down, other scientists are saying, no freaking way. And NASA has distanced itself from the whole deal. Reason being, the big beef with it is that there's no evidence that the bacteria actually existed within the meteorite before it landed. What also supports this beef is that the meteorites weren't discovered yesterday. They were discovered 100, 200 years ago, something like that. And since their discovery had been handled heavily by humans. Basically, there was definitely an obviously bacteria present within this meteorite, but there was no proof that it was there before the meteorite landed. I don't believe NASA's playing skeptic here, though. I think they just don't want to be called out again after that arsenic bacteria incident that I talked about a few episodes ago. Link right here. Yeah, I know, it's kind of an old episode. Also, to add to that, there was a little bit more research done on the whole arsenic DNA-based type stuff, and they found some interesting stuff. Namely, that it debunks the entire idea of arsenic bacteria. Normal DNA has a phosphorus base to it, and phosphorus-based DNA has a half-life of about 1.1 million years, which is why we can take these DNA samples of mammoths and possibly clone them, linked to the episode where I talked about right here. However, arsenic-based DNA has a half-life of approximately 10 minutes. Since arsenic is a much less stable molecule, it makes it hydrolyze or react with the water around it. And when it does this, it just falls apart. Yeah, good luck reproducing with your DNA having to decompose every 10 minutes. On to another story, and this one's something very, very strange. So you've probably heard of and maybe experienced one of those really random chain of events that cause really awesome outcomes. For example, you slip on a banana peel, slide under a couch that two big burly men are carrying out of a smart car, you trip over and fall on a cat, and the cat gives you $200. Totally happened to me. For one Australian city named Victoria, the combination of fire and rain washed ash and nitrogen-rich soil into the Gippsland Lakes, which experienced a rise in water level. That caused the lakes to mix with some seawater, which also raised the salinity of the entire deal. All this led to, believe it or not, the lakes glowing. This isn't the first time this has ever happened, and it actually results from an introduction of a species of algae into the lake waters, which is generally known as the sea sparkle. This algae has what is called bioluminescence, otherwise known as, ooh, pretty glowy, or as sane people call it, the natural ability to light up in the dark by use of pigment called luciferin. Luciferin reacts with oxygen to create light, of all things. But if you'd like to see a couple more of those really awesome pictures, the link is in the description. Also, something else really cool happening having to do with the sea has to do with whale sharks. Whale sharks are the biggest living fish species known to man. They're not whales, they're sharks. But they're huge sharks. And sharks are indeed fish. They are known as the whale shark for exactly that, their size. And yet, as big as they are, they feed on the tiniest things in the sea, namely plankton. Now and then they're seen feeding on very tiny fish, but nevertheless, they eat really tiny stuff. So you don't have to worry about being tracked down by one of these things and end up dying in an epic death with a shark conveniently named Jaws munching away at your feet. The way these giant things suck up a whole bunch of tiny things is they just swim around with their mouths open like... Uh, 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 and just sift water through their gills 
which actually kind of look like scouring pads. All the water goes through, anything else gets deflected down the throat. No, I'm not going to do a joke with that. But as big as they are, there is surprisingly little known about them. We only know a little bit about their swimming routes, and even then we don't know why they travel them. Also, we have no idea where they reproduce or even how they reproduce. The reason I'm bringing up whale sharks is that there's something interesting going on with them. Once a year, they have been gathering in one specific place near the surface of the Yucatan Peninsula, which is the landmass that separates the Caribbean Sea from the Gulf of Mexico. The reason they're gathering at this specific place is that right below, the night before they show up, there's a lot of breeding going on with a specific type of tuna called the little penny. What happens is a whole bunch of eggs are laid, and the eggs gradually rise to the surface. Come morning, there's a whole bunch of eggs in the area, and a whole bunch of whale sharks to accompany them. This occurrence provides for an astounding opportunity to study these guys, since we know basically nothing about them. And it provides tourists something to look at and with the tourists leave a little bit more of a sense of awareness on what's going on in the world outside their computer universes. But in other news, the zombie ant apocalypse is here. Okay, maybe not, but the zombie ants are. There's been a new type of fungus that's been found in Brazil. I'm not even going to try to pronounce its name. And they can take control of a poor, unsuspecting ant's brain and basically drive it to its doom while infecting other ants on the way. The fungus that infects the ant does so for transportation to an ideal spot that it can grow and thrive in, as well as reproduce. Not so the ant can reproduce, so the fungus can reproduce. It'd just be weird if the zombie ants kind of reproduced. You'd have weird zombie baby ants. Anyway, once the fungus has found this location, it makes the ant bite down on something solid for support and promptly kills the ant. After a few days, the fungus is seen growing out of the head of the ant, and you have a successful use of zombification. And yes, that's a word I looked it up. Oh, and don't worry, this fungus doesn't infect humans, so we won't be playing Left for Dead in real life anytime soon. However, this fungus and others like it do infect other insects as well, including wasps, flies, and crickets. There are a few more science things that I could talk about, but let's save that for next week because one, I think this episode's getting a little bit long. Two, I'm hungry and I want to go to dinner. Three, I need something to talk about next week. So links to all the stuff I talked about are in the drop down bar and even perhaps a bonus story that you could read about that I didn't talk about today. If you have any cool science stuff or even stuff that's cool and not science, since this show is called Science or Not, just let me know in a comment or a video response and I might talk about it in the next show. Thanks for watching my almost 13 minutes of science. Like it if you like it, and subscribe if you love it. I think that's all I got for you. See you later. All right, let's make this one a good one. Yeah. Never made a vlog while walking before. It gets you kind of winded. Anyway, so, uh...